Welcome. My name is Ben Bennett. I am the director of HPC Strategic Programs here at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. It is my great uh, pleasure and honor to be talking to Professor Mark Parsons uh, from the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center. And we're going to talk uh, a little about exascale, what it means. We're going to talk less about the technology and more about the science, the requirements and the need for exascale uh, rather than a deep dive into the enabling technologies. Mark, welcome. Hi, Ben. Thanks very much for inviting me to talk. Complete pleasure. Um, so I'd like to kick off with, um, I suppose, uh, quite an interesting look back. You and I are both of a certain age, 25 plus, um, and we've seen these milestones, uh, I suppose they're the SI milestones of high performance computings come and go, you know, from a gigaflop back in 1987, and a teraflop in 97, a petaflop in 2008. But we seem to be taking longer in getting to an exaflop. Um, so I'd like your thoughts. Why is, why is an exaflop taking so long? So I think that's a very interesting question because, you know, I, I started my career uh, in parallel computing in 1989. And when I joined, an EPCC was set up then, you know, we're 30 years old this year in 1990. And, you know, the, the fastest computer we had then was 800 megaflops, just under a gigaflop. So in my career, we've gone, you know, already when we reached the PETA scale, we'd already gone um, uh, pretty much a million times faster. Mm. And, you know, the, the step from a teraflop to a petaflop scale system really didn't feel particularly difficult. Um, and yet the step from, an, from a petaflop, petascale system to an exaflop is a really, really big challenge. And I think it's really actually related to what's happened with computer processors over the last decade, where individually, you know, a processor core like you have on your laptop or whatever hasn't got much faster. We've just got more of them. So the perception of more speed, but actually it's just been delivered by more cores. And as you go down that approach, you know, that happens in the supercomputing world as well. Um, we've gone uh, in 2010, I think we had systems that were, you know, a few thousand cores. Um, our main national service in the UK for the last eight years has had 118,000 cores. But looking at the X scale, we're looking at, you know, four or five million cores. And taming that level of parallelism is the real challenge. And that's why it's taking an enormous amount of time to uh, deliver these systems. And it's not just on the hardware front, you know, vendors like HPE have to deliver world beating technology and it's hard but then there's also the challenge to the users how do they get the codes to work in the face of that much parallelism if you look at um the the complexities of delivering an, an exaflop um, and you could have bought an exaflop you know, three or four years ago you couldn't have housed it you couldn't have powered it you couldn't have afforded it um and you couldn't program it but you still, you could have, you could have bought one. Um, we should have been so lucky to be enabled to supply it. Um, the software, um, I think, from our standpoint, is is looking like where we're doing more enabling with our, our customers. You sell them a machine, and then the 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 need then to do collaboration specifically seems more and more around the software. Um, so it's, it's going to be relatively easy to get one exaflop using Linpack, but, but that's not exascale. So what do you think an exascale machine versus an exaflop machine means to the people like yourself, to your users, the scientists and industry. What is an exaflop versus an exascale? So I think, uh, you know, supercomputing moves forward by setting itself challenges. And when you, when you look 
at all of the exascale programs worldwide that are trying to deliver systems that can do an exaflop or more. It's actually a very arbitrary challenge. You know, we set ourselves a petascale challenge of delivering a petaflop and somebody managed that. And, and, but, you know, the world moves forward by setting itself challenges. Um, I think, you know, we use quite an arbitrary definition of what we mean as well by an exaflop. So, you know, in, in your and my world, um, we either, you know, we, 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 we first of all say well, a flop is a computation, it's a multiply or it's an add or whatever. And we tend to uh, 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 look at, at, at that as using high, very high precision numbers, so 64 bit numbers. And, you know, we then say, well, you've got to do for an exa block, you've got to do a billion, billion of those calculations every second. You know, so at some of that's an arbitrary target. Now, you know, today from HPE, I can buy a system that will do a billion, billion calculations per second. And they will either do that as a theoretical peak, which would be almost unattainable, or using benchmarks that um, stress the system and, and demonstrate a real exit block. But again, those benchmarks themselves are tuned to, do, to just um, do those calculations and deliver an exit block in a quite a, 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 a sterile way, if you like. So, you know, we, 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 we've kind of set ourselves this, this, this big challenge, you know, the big fence on the race course, which we're clambering over. But the challenge in itself actually should be and much more interestingly, what are we going to use these devices for having built them? Um, so getting into the exascale era is not so much about doing an exaflop. It's a new generation of capability that allows us to do better scientific and industrial research. And that's the interesting bit in this whole story. Uh, I, I, I would tend to agree with you. I think uh, the, um, the focus around exascale is to look at, you know, new technologies, new ways of doing things, new ways of looking at data and to get new results. So eventually you, you will get yourself a, an, an, an exascale machine. Um, one hopes sooner rather than later. Um, well, I'm sure you'd love to sell me one, Ben. It's got nothing to do with me. I can't sell you anything, Mark. Um, but there are people outside the door over there who would love to sell you one, yes. Um, however, if we, if you look at your, you know, your your exascale machine, um, how do you believe the workloads are going to be different on an exascale machine versus your current petascale machine? So I think um, there's always a slight conceit when you buy a new national supercomputer, and and that conceit is that you're buying a capability that you know. And, and, and that many people will run on the whole system. Now, in truth, we do have people that run on the whole of our Archer system for days. That's 118,000 cores. But I would say, you know, looking at the system, people that run over, say, half of that can be counted on, your, on a single hand in a year. And they're doing very specific things. It's very costly simulation they're running. And so, you know, if you look at these systems today, two things shine out. One is... Um, it's very difficult to get time on them. There are baroque application procedures. Um, all of the uh, uh, requirements have to be assessed by your peers, and you're given quite limited amounts of time that you have to eke out to do your science. And people tend to run their applications in the sweet spot, where their application delivers the best performance. And, you know, we've tried to push our users over time to use reasonably sized jobs. So I think our average job size is about 20,000 cores nowadays, which is not bad. But that does mean that as we move to the exascale, two things have to happen. One is actually, I think we've got to be more relaxed about giving people access to these systems. So let's give more people access, let people play, let people try out ideas they've never tried out before. And I think that will lead to a lot more innovation in computational science. But at the same time, I think we also need to be less precious. You know, we need to accept that these systems will have a variety of sizes of job on them. You know, we're still going to have people that want to run on 4 million cores or 2 million cores. 
that's absolutely fine. And I absolutely salute those people for trying the really, really difficult. But then we're going to have a huge spectrum of users all the way down to people that want to run on 500 cores or whatever. So I think we need to broaden the user base in an exascale system. And I know this is what is happening, for example, in Japan with the new Japanese uh, system. So, Mark, if you cast your mind back to almost exactly a year ago, after the HPC user forum, uh, you were interviewed for Primeur magazine. Uh, and you alluded in that article to the needs of scientific industrial users requiring, you know, uh, uh, an exaflop or an exascale machine. Uh, it's clear in your, in your previous answer regarding, you know, the workloads. Some would say that the majority of people would be happier with, say, 10, 100 petaflop machines, you know, democratization, more people access. But can you provide us examples at the the type of science um, the needs of industrial users that actually do require those resources to be put together as an exascale machine so i think you know the, it's a very interesting area at the end of the day these systems are bought because they are capability systems and, and i absolutely take the argument that why shouldn't we buy 10 100 petaflop systems but there are a number of scientific areas, even today, that would benefit from an exascale system. And, and, and these are the sort of scientific areas that will use as much um, access onto a system and as much time and as much scale of the system as they can, as you can give them. And so, so an immediate example would be people doing quantum chromodynamics uh, calculations, you know, particle physics uh, theoretical calculations. They will just use whatever you give them. Um, but you know, I think one of the areas that is very interesting is actually the engineering uh, space where, you know, many people worry that engineering applications over the last decade haven't really kept up with the sort of supercomputers that we have. And I'm leading a project called Asimov, funded by uh, EPSOC uh, in the UK, which uh, is jointly with Rolls-Royce, jointly funded by Rolls-Royce, and also working with the universities of Cambridge, Oxford, Bristol and Warwick. And we're trying to do a whole engine gas turbine simulation for the first time. So that's looking at the structure of the gas turbine, the, the, the airplane engine, uh, the structure of it, how it's all bolted together, looking at the uh, fluid dynamics of the air and the hot gases that flow through it, looking at the combustion of the engine, uh, looking at how fuel is sprayed into the combustion chamber, looking at the electrics around it, looking at the, the way the engine deforms as it heats up and cools down, all of that. Now, Rolls-Royce have wanted to do that for 20 years. And uh, whenever they certify a new engine, you know, it has to go through a number of physical tests. And every time they do one of those tests, it, it can cost them as much as 25 to $30 million. So these are very expensive tests, particularly when they they do what's called a blade off test, which would be, you know, a blade failure. They've got to prove that the engine um, contains the uh, the fragments of the blade. So the plane can be flying. It's a really important test and all engines have to pass it. What we want to do is do, uh, is use an exascale computer to properly model uh, a blade off test for the first time. So that in future, some uh, simulations can uh, become uh, uh, virtual rather than having to, you know, uh, spend all of the money that Rolls-Royce would normally uh, spend. And, you know, it's a fascinating project because it's a really hard project to do. One of the things um, that I do is I'm deputy chair this year of the Gordon Bell Prize. Um, and I've really enjoyed doing that. It's one of the major um, uh, prizes in our area, that, you know, you know it gets announced at Supercomputing every year. So I have the pleasure of reading all the submissions each year. And, and what's been really interesting, I've been doing, this is my third year of doing it, of being on the committee. And what's really interesting is the way that, you know, big systems like Summit, for example, in the US, have pushed the uh, user communities um, to try and do simulations no, nobody's done before. You know, and, and we've seen this as well um, with papers coming out of the first uh, use of the Fugaku system in Japan, for example. And people, you know, these are very, very broad. These are, you know, earthquake simulation, um, uh, large eddy simulations of boats, um, you know, um, a number of things around uh, genome-wide association studies, for example. So 
the use of these computers spans a vast area of uh, uh, computational science. And I think um, the really, really important thing about these systems is they're challenging people to do calculations that they've never done before. That's what's important. Okay, thank you. Um, you talked about challenges. Uh, when I nearly said when you and I had lots of hair, but that's probably much more true of me. Um, we used to talk about grand challenges. We talked about, especially around the teraflop era, the, the, the ASCII Red program driving, you know, the grand challenges of science, uh, possibly to hide the fact that it was a, a bomb designing computer. Uh, so they talked about the grand challenges. Um, we don't seem to talk about that much. We, we talk about exascale, we talk about data. Um, where are the grand challenges that you see that an exascale computer can, you know, can help us? So I think grand challenges didn't go away, just the phrase went out of fashion. Um, Much I, like my hair. <laughs> I think it's interesting, the, the I, I do feel that science moves forward by setting itself grand challenges and always had, has done. You know, my, my original uh, uh, background is in particle physics. I was very lucky to spend four years at CERN working in the early stages of the LEP accelerator when it first came online. And, you know, the scientists then, I think they worked on LEP 15 years before I, I came in and uh, uh, did my little PhD on it. And I think that way of organizing science hasn't changed. We just talk less about grand challenges. I think, you know, what I've seen over the last few years is a renaissance in computational science, looking at things that have previously, you know, people have said have been impossible. So a couple of years ago, for example, one of the key Gordon Bell Prize papers was on genome-wide association studies on summit. Uh, in fact, it may be one of the winners, if I remember rightly. And uh, that was really, really interesting because, first of all, you know, the sort of the genome-wide association studies had gone out of favour in the bioinformatics, biosciences community because people thought they weren't possible to compute. Mm. But that particular paper showed, yes, you could do these really, really big combinatorial problems in a reasonable amount of time if you had a big enough computer. And one of the things I felt all the way through my career, actually, is... Um, we've probably discarded more simulations because they were impossible at the time than we've actually decided to do. And I, I sometimes think, you know, we need to challenge ourselves by looking at the things we've discarded in the past and say, oh, look, you know, we can actually do that now. And, and I think part of the, the, the challenge of bringing an ESCO service to life is to get people to think about what they would use it for. And that's a key thing. Otherwise, you know, I always say a, a computer that is unused should just be turned off. There's no point in having an underutilized supercomputer. Everybody loses from that. So let, let's bring ourselves slightly more up to date. Uh, we're in the middle of a, of a global pandemic. Uh, and one of the things in our industry has been, that, I, that I've been particularly proud about is I've seen uh, the vendors, all the vendors, you know, offering up machines and uh, making resources available for people to fight uh, this, this current disease. Um, how do you see supercomputers now and in the future speeding up things like vaccine discovery and, help, and helping doctors generally? So I think you're quite right that, um, you know, the supercomputer community around the world actually did a really good job of responding to COVID-19 in as much as, um, you know, speaking for the UK, we put in place a, a rapid access program. So anybody wanted to do COVID research on the various national services we have down to the tier two services could get really quick access. Um, and that, that has worked really well. Now in the UK, you know, we, we didn't have, I mean, Archer is an old system now, as you, as you know. We didn't have the world's largest supercomputer, but it has happily been running um, lots of uh, COVID-19 simulations, largely for the, the, the biomedical community looking at drug uh, uh, modeling and, and, and molecular modeling largely. And that's just been going. In the US, uh, they've been doing really large um, 
uh, combinatorial parameter search problems on, uh, uh, on, on Summit. Mm -hmm. For example, looking to see um, whether or not uh, old drugs uh, could be reused to solve a new problem. Um, and so I think, I think actually in some respects, COVID-19 has been, um, uh, this sounds wrong, but it's actually been good for supercomputing in as much as it's pointed out to governments that supercomputers are important parts of any uh, scientifically active country's uh, re research infrastructure. So um, I'll finish up um, and tap into uh, your inner geek. Um, there's a lot of technologies that are being banded around um, to currently enable, you know, the, the first exascale machine, wherever that's going to be uh, from whomever. What are the current technologies or emerging technologies that you are interested in, excited about, looking forward to getting your hands on? So in, in, in the business case that I've written for the UK's exascale computer, I actually characterize this as a choice between the American model and the Japanese model. Okay. And both of pros and both of cons. Um, so in America, they've very much gone down the, uh, you know, cores plus GPU or GPUs route. Um, so you might have, you know, an Intel Xeon or an AMD processor at the center or an ARM processor for that matter. And you might have, you know, two to four GPUs. I think the most interesting thing that I've seen is, is definitely this move to a single address space. So the data that you have will be uh, accessible by the GPUs and the CPU. I think, you know, that, that's really been one of the key things that has stopped the uptake of GPUs today. And that, that, that one single change is going to, uh, I think, uh, uh, make things very, very interesting. But I'm not entirely convinced by the CPU GPU model, because I think that um, uh, it's very difficult to get all the, all the performance out of a GPU. You know, it'll do well in HPL, for example, high performance limb pack benchmark we're discussing at the beginning of this interview. Mm. But in real scientific workloads, you know, you, you, you still find it difficult to find all the performance that, that, that is promised. Mm. So, you know, the Japanese approach, which is the cores only approach, um, I think is very attractive in as much as, you know, they, they're using very high bandwidth memory a um, very interesting processor, which they are going to have to, you know, which they've, they've co-developed together over a 10 year period. And this is one of the things that people don't realize. The, the Japanese program and the American Exascale program has been working for 10 years mm. on these systems. Now, I think the Japanese process is really interesting because um, it, when you look at the performance, it really does work for their scientific workload. And that's, that does interest me a lot. This, this combination of a, a processor designed to do good science, high bandwidth memory, and a real understanding of how data flows around the supercomputer. Um, I think those are the things that are exciting me at the moment. Obviously, you know, there's new networking technologies. I think in the fullness of time, not necessarily for the first systems, but, you know, over the next decade, we're going to see much, you know, much more activity around silicon photonics. I think that's really, really fascinating. All of these things, I think, in some respects, the last decade has just been quite um, incremental in improvements. But I think where supercomputing is going at the moment, we're at a very, very disruptive moment. And that, you know, again, that goes back to the start of this discussion. Why is the exascale been difficult to get to? Actually, because it's a disruptive moment in technology. Professor Parsons, thank you very much for your time and your insights. Thank, thank you. you very much, Pleasure. And folks, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you've learned something um, or at least enjoyed it. With that, I would ask you to stay safe and goodbye.